are you? Play. All right, we're recording. All right, here we are. Welcome to our third meeting of our book club for OC Seals. This is uh, our book club. We review the book uh, Triathlon Freestyle Simplified. Last time I didn't say anything like that at the beginning, so I didn't know where to crop the uh, the meaningless conversation we were having before we started the book review. So this time I at least say it, so now I can go back and crop it when I post it for the people that missed, uh, missed this show. They want to tune in and watch it later. All right, so we are in our second uh, set of pages that we were supposed to review, pages uh, 48 to 104, which was basically the, the technique area of the book, which uh, as a few people mentioned, including Ronnie, who's uh, you know pretty into technique, that was very technical and kind of complicated. And, and I agree with that. I do not really enjoy sometimes reading about technique stuff. I do it and, and I try to get my head around it. And I realize places where and, it, and a good example is reading some of your comments of like how you interpret it differently uh, than maybe how it, what I think is right or just what was maybe meant by the writer. And, um, but it's also not necessarily better always to go on videos and watch YouTube either because the, those aren't always real accurate or have the best uh, descriptions of what's going on either. So. That's where I think this uh, discussion good, where we can kind of come to consen some consensus or talk about some clarifications of things that I read uh, of your comments. And there's definitely several that were very interesting to me. So um, this, this whole sec session that this whole section of reading was just all technique stuff, basically. Um, and I wouldn't say it was way off. I would just say there were some things I didn't really agree with or think we could explain better. But uh, uh, I did like some of the way it got broken out into different sections. Um, my simple breakout is uh, the three simple concepts of swimming are be straight and firm is like number one. And then number two is to be balanced and aligned, which means you're not wiggling like fishtailing. And then finally, you work on rhythmic propulsion, what moves you forward. And if you do number one and two well, it doesn't take that much propulsion to move you forward. But if you're not doing number one and number two well, if you're not straight and firm, if you're not balanced, then it takes a lot more energy output or people are bleeding a lot more of their energy out to wiggle through the water to go places. So, uh, but it all boils down to being a chicken and the egg thing. Is it more important to have propulsion or is it important to be like streamlined and have good technique? And the answer is you really need to have both. And some people are weaker in one, some are weaker in others. Some need to really work on both. But we're going to go through and kind of define these areas. And from the questions or from the comments I heard, uh, I lost my page of notes. Give me one second to get here. And I can need to get back to the view of, let's see. All right. There we go. Laura, um, <laughs> you were one of the ones who turned in your homework. Thank you very much. Um, can you I'm pulling yours up real quick. I'm sorry, I lost it. I had it and I lost it. Right now I'm looking at uh, Ronnie's uh, well done, um, what do you call it, Natalie? Her, oh yeah, her, her, uh, her chart. Charts, man, it's like dialed in. Yeah, she her does, table, her word table. Her tables, yeah, she yeah. has tables on her, her stuff. tables. pretty crazy. Yeah, do you want me to read the first question of Sounds our specific? Good. You want me to read the first question? Yeah. Okay, so the first question on this on the section that the specific questions for our pages 48 to 104 is why should you do drills and how much drilling should you do? So Laura, let me hear your vision of that. So 
my thought, both from reading the book and listening to coaches I have been around, is that you drill in order to find out where your weaknesses or limiters are and then address those sandwiched into swimming. So like how much to drill, I don't know that there's an exact science answer, but it's, it's definitely like less than half of what you're actually swimming. And you want to drill so that you feel what you're supposed to be doing right and then put it into your swim stroke and then do a different drill and then swim. That's what I think. Yeah. Who else has some, some comments or suggestions or know what the percentage of your swim time or swim yardage or whatever should be for drilling versus swimming? Maybe Nor, what do you think? For drilling. Oh, go ahead, Catherine. Oh, I was just going to say like 10 to 15 of drilling, not that much, but I think the drill, I think you can work on it during swimming, but I also think you can work on the actual thing that you're not good at during the drill itself, like whether it's the catch or... You mean during the swim itself? Well, during, while you're drilling, doing that drill for the swim. Am I making sense? <laughs> while you're drilling? <laughs> <laughs> I would say about 80-20, Mike, where 20% being the drill or so, but not getting too technical with it because I think that's something I tend to do when I come across a specific technique, right? Uh, in the past, I have gotten too technical. And there was a sentence that I read in the book that adult swimmers tend to know a lot about swimming compared to children who just go with the natural flow. And that's where they end up uh, swimming better than adults. So, yeah, I mean, while drills and techniques are important, but it was also something that you shouldn't get too bogged down to when doing the actual swim and go with the feel of the water as well. So I, I don't, I couldn't find the exact thing cause I should have brought my goddamn book. I forgot to get my book out of my bag. Um, you can be focusing on technique while swimming full stroke freestyle. Mm -hmm. And that can be a drill actually. And that's really where a lot of your drilling should actually be full stroke swimming with some technical focus point that you're really trying to do. For example, swimming 100, going 25, breathe only to your left, 25, breathe only to your right, and then a 50, breathe every third stroke. You're full stroke swimming the whole way, but you're actually drilling as well because you're doing things that are kind of outside of your normal range maybe of how you normally breathe. So that's technically still a drill. But if you went 10 100s like that, you're also getting a fair amount of conditioning as well. So don't feel like you have to do all these silly chicken arm drills or you know, one arm or whatever, which we still do in some of our practices at Nova. You can do a lot of your drills as specific focus points within full stroke swimming like the six parts of the freestyle that, you know, is somewhat talked about in this book, not somewhat, it's talked a lot. They, they talk about five elements of, of the pulse of the stroke. I prefer to call it six and it's in pairs. So they're chantable and repeatable, but just changing your thought focus from enter and extend to catch and pull to exit and recover. That's like three separate drills of swimming still full stroke freestyle but they're at different intensities and everything. So because most of you swim fairly infrequently and not very much yardage, you can't afford to do a lot of drilling. You need to be swimming, but with technique focus in everything you do and changing up breathing patterns, changing up uh, you know, different focus points on parts of the stroke where you're weakest. And you'll learn those from some video taping or from Sometimes, as Laura mentioned, uh, this is another good point. Sometimes doing a drill will show you something you suck at. You know, like one arm freestyle with your other arm down by your side, breathing away from the arm you're stroking with, that becomes drowning drill for a lot of people because they don't have enough propulsion and they're not turning their body to get their breath and stuff. So that's a pretty good eye opener to something you're not very good at. But overall... Uh, I see a lot of people at the pool 
especially on the lap swim lanes, doing drills that I look at them and I go, I wonder what they're trying to do because it looks really bad and they're not getting hardly any fitness. They're going so slow and whatever they're doing isn't reinforcing anything I think that would be beneficial. Um, breathing was uh, a big, uh, uh, it was all over the board with what people wrote about what they thought about breathing. And uh, uh, Ronnie, uh, a very highly experienced swimmer, had some comments on breathing. And I don't know if you have it in front of you, Ronnie, if you can talk about what you wrote about your breathing. Well, basically, I need to focus on my breathing because um, I tend to, in the pool, when I'm going into the wall, I tend to take a big gulp of air right before I make my turn. And then I hold my breath. And so I think that's what's popping me up to the surface too soon. And I feel that urge like I need air and I'm just gasping. Um, for air after that. So I think what I need to focus on is always exhaling. And um, I mean, it seems simple enough and I know it intuitively, but when I'm in the, when I'm swimming, I don't really do it. So the funny thing is, is you're wrong in that holding your air, uh, it, it might pop you up earlier and you should definitely be pushing off deeper. That's a swimming, you know, racing thing separate from open water here. Right. But holding your air is a good thing for coming out of walls so you don't have to breathe. Because as soon as you exhale, you have to inhale almost immediately. So you've actually been doing it correctly to hold your breath in the turn, if you actually are. And we don't know if you actually are. You might think you are. And if we watch the video of you doing a turn, we might see all these bubbles coming out when you flip turn and you don't even know that you're blowing all your air out. You think you're getting a big breath going into the turn and you might, but you also might have just blown it all out going through the actual flip turn and therefore come up to the surface early to get a breath. I, you for sure are or aren't because I don't have the video footage, but when I videotape people, it's one of the things I do is I get the, them coming off the wall and I want to see when the bubbles come out. Like when are, when are they exhaling and if they're exhaling all the air during the turn or not. Uh -huh. Now, this whole air thing, and breathing patterns and all that. It's a really complex issue. And there isn't a right answer here. This is something where it would be nice to get a lot of variable options for you, for everyone. And that was what was really right about your answer that you thought was wrong. You said you randomly change your breathing patterns. Oh yeah, I did. Sometimes breathe every third. You sometimes breathe only on the left. You sometimes breathe on the right. You sometimes breathe every stroke on both sides, right? I do. So do I. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you don't lift your head or lose momentum, more air is better. And there was a there was a coach, a coach that's an Olympian, uh, and he coached a lot of elite level athletes. And he taught people to double breathe into a turn, meaning they got a breath on the right, right into a breath on the left, and then they went into their turn. And then they did an awesome underwater because they had so much air from getting those two breaths right before their turn. So there isn't really a right answer on breathing. What we do tend to find is people that only have one option for breathing, it doesn't work in all situations and that becomes a problem. Uh, as Laura mentioned, I think in hers of like, she likes to breathe to either side. And I didn't re really understand, uh, Laura, what you meant by three, three and two, two on your breath. Can you breathe every three, breathe every two. You, what strokes. That? On strokes. Well, on strokes, breathe every three strokes so that I'm every bilateral, two. sometimes breathing every two strokes. Mm -hmm. But so you just didn't write. I default to every third. It just says three dash three and two dash two. I didn't know if that meant you go three breaths to one side and then three breaths to the other <laughs> side, or it means yeah, breathing every third. Yeah, it means breathing uh, every three for a while, mm -hmm. and then you know change it up and breathe every two just to. You know. So just, my, I, the, go up, sorry. No, sorry. I have a quick question regarding breathing, and this is especially for long distance races, right? One of the areas I read was when you exhale, you actually release a lot of carbon dioxide, 
which reduces fatigue in muscles, right? So when you do open water swimming, specifically when you have us do around 60 to 65 uh, strokes per stroke rate, right? Um, what's the right, I mean, there may not be a right answer, right? But how do you, like, do you breathe every alternate stroke or hold in and breathe every two or three strokes? What's the right way around it? Because I have found myself doing a combination of both sometimes. Um, I'm just trying to identify, maybe getting a little too technical here. So I associate how often you breathe with high, how high of intensity you're going at. You okay. should practice swimming at easy pace. And I, I consider limited breathing like every third stroke, every fourth stroke, or every fifth stroke to be uh, carburetor governor swimming. Like mm -hmm. to keep a race car from going too fast, they put a limiter on their carburetors. So when they're on these super tracks, they don't want them to go 240 miles an hour around the track because they get in wrecks. So they put these limiters on their carburetors that don't allow their intake and therefore the car can't go too fast. If you swim breathing every fourth or every fifth stroke, mm -hmm. you have to dial it the heck down. Because if you're going fast to get to that breath, you're just going to get wiped out. You're not going to be able to keep up with it. So you have to go into like, Prius mode, you know, really energy efficient, <laughs> cruising along to get to that breath and not be rushing there. You know, it's got to be like really dialing down to like watch battery power, you know, very little energy output. And that's a good skill to develop efficiency in your swimming, but it's not the way to race. Um, the other side of the equation is people that always breathe every second stroke and they always breathe the very first stroke off the wall right uh, cr mm -hmm. uh krishna yeah he wants to push off the wall and he looks like uh screen share i don't know if you're on on for this, this is, oh i've uh, been there i know what you're talking about definitely been there did that's, you see this? were yeah. you here to see this krishna you guys uh, see this? no i missed this part yeah can you see this picture i do <laughs> I'm going to send that to you. That's going to be your new screensaver. All right. So a lot of people do that. Push off it <gasps> on their very first stroke off the wall. And that's due to what I was telling Ronnie. It's like they're blowing all their air out on the push off. And that causes you to have to bring the air in right away. When you breathe every second stroke, it should allow you to keep a nice long distance per stroke, get that extension, get to the breath and get back down. And we had a guy come a couple of years ago to do a clinic on, on swimming technique. And I think the only one, I don't know, Jen O'Keefe was there. She was going to be on this call, but I can't remember if anyone else from here was at that. But it was a really interesting uh, experience because we worked on some swimming technique, but a lot of it was about the breathing and the breathing timing. And the concept was that your body is kind of like um, – uh, a Coke can made out of rubber. And when you exhale, that, that can kind of collapses. And when you inhale, the can expands and it gets supported from the inside, from that air is creating the structure of your body. And if you suck in too much air, it looks like a can of Coke that's been in the freezer. You know how it gets all too fat and all weird. So we've got to get this right amount of structure created from our inhale and keep that kind of from the inside out to hold the structure of our body. And then we have to breathe above that with small little bite-sized breaths to get enough oxygen in and out. And if we suck in too much, as Nora was bringing up, you can't get rid of the carbon dioxide and you start getting desperate for breath. Um, so it's this, it's just playing with finding the right amount of air that you get in and out that's the correct amount, but realize that your breath is part of the structure of your body and that it can create the firmness as opposed to using muscular energy, you know, to try to tighten your body. That only lasts a very short amount of time and then your legs drop. So if you can create that structure with air, it's a much easier way to do it. But once you can do it kind of naturally, it's really hard to think about it and be swimming and, and thinking about your effort and all this stuff. So breathing is a super critical element. 
but I kind of find that people think about their breathing and their form goes to crap because they're, they're not doing propulsive things or they think about their stroke and they're not breathing in the right timing and they get gassed out and then their stroke falls apart. So in learning it, it's kind of good to go on both sides of the equation, two sandboxes, I call it the technique sandbox of propulsion and moving forward with your arm stroke and then the breathing side. And you have to marry them together because if you just swim with the snorkel, it's not teaching you how to breathe in connection with what you're doing swimming wise. So a snorkel can be helpful, definitely, but you also have to swim connecting the breath into whatever you've been, been working on. So that's a, that's a big ordeal. So there really aren't right answers on the air. It's like, it's more just like, you got to figure out what you're doing incorrectly. That's breaking your stroke and things like breathing late, you know, cause your arms pressed down too far. That's an issue. Um, just breathing too frequently, too infrequently, all these things are issues. And so you really want to work at having any breathing uh, pattern you could do. And that's Ronnie. If I asked her to breathe every second, she can do it. If I asked her to breathe every third, she could do it or every fourth or every fifth. And she's going to have to dial her energy or her output up or down to make that breathing pattern. And other people just don't have that ability. Um, do you have to be able to breathe bilaterally all the time? You definitely don't. Um, and I don't recommend it for racing, but um, it can help a little bit with navigation. Uh, the alignment of your head when you get the breath is just such a critical element that um, I call it uh, the clock and six is straight down. That's where you're looking when you're not breathing. And then the place you look at on the clock when you get a breath, it's not three o'clock or nine o'clock. It's 10 o'clock or two o'clock. It's slightly upward. Mm. And some people over rotate and look almost straight up. And then that's rolling too far to get the breath. And some people only go to nine, but they have to lift their head up or their chin comes out forward. And those are two deal breakers on form as well. So six and 10 or six and two are really good focus points and some of the chants that you can use when you're swimming to, to tell yourself, am I only looking there and there? Six and 10, six and 10, six and 10, or six and two versus just wandering around looking, looking for the air. Um, Jimena, go yes. ahead. I have a quick question regarding the breathing. I've never been coached other than when I was little. So somebody gave me the advice, like when you take in oxygen, because I used to like, once I took it in, I just blew it out right away. So somebody gave me the advice to inhale and then imagine like close my teeth a little or my mouth and have like little bubbles coming out and try to make it last as long as, it, as I could. Is that correct? Is that a good technique? Like it helps me to lower my heartbeat and to relax. So I've been using that technique since I started swimming here, but I don't know if it's the right way. And what pattern are you talking about? Breathing every second stroke or every third stroke or some other pattern? I, I don't follow any. I mean, I usually do every second, third on each side. Like I don't have a specific one or I'm not stuck to any of but I just mean the way to keep the oxygen in your lungs until you are prepared for the next one. Because I used to do like, <gasps> and then it was gone. So now what I do is like, <gasps> and then, <sighs> and like eventually release it until I'm ready for the next one. And that's why your stroke rate so goddamn slow. Oh. So <laughs> it matters with the breathing <laughs> pattern, okay? So. Oh. How frequently are you supposed to be stay, taking a stroke, Jimena? Like three or four. What do you mean? Not a breath. How frequently uh, are you supposed to take a stroke? Every second. Yes. One stroke per second. Uh -huh. So that means you're going to inhale once every two seconds. Okay. One, two, three. Uh. So you have to time how much of the time is inhale, hold, and exhale. There's Got not it. really enough time to do all that. <laughs> That's why I'm so slow. 
So that's what I'm trying to teach you guys is learning the right rhythm for, so that's why there's no right answer. I bet most of you here, including myself, don't really know the percentage of exhale you do out of your mouth versus your nose. How many of you guys know? Are you blowing more out of your mouth or your nose? Is it equal? Do you not use your nose? Do you just use your mouth? Yeah, I just it's use hard my mouth. To know that, but it's important to kind of figure it out. I just use my mouth. To get air out in a hurry, it's got to come out your mouth. If you're going to do like breathing every third stroke, I like inhale, hold it, exhale, inhale, hold it, exhale, inhale. Uh -oh. That's a breathing pattern for every third stroke. There is a hold if you're going to breathe every third. But if you're going to breathe every second stroke, you don't have time to hold. If you do, then you're going to be lifting your head and leaving your head out in the air for too long to try to get the air in. And that's a big rookie mistake that a lot of people do is they take this giant breath. <gasps> they don't get it all out. So then they have to like blow their air out into the air and breathe back in at the same time. That's why their heads are hanging out there so long. Okay. Breathing right. is a complicated scenario, and it's one of the things you want to kind of tune up or play with, and it takes a lot of time just to get the breathing thing. But, you know, we got to go somewhere when we swim, too, so we have to work on the propulsion thing, too. And is one more important than the other? Well, you need them both because – if you don't go anywhere when you swim, you're really slow. But if you can't breathe when you swim, you're going to get really tired in a hurry and you're not going to go anywhere. So that's what I talk about. You want to do things that are drills, working on breathing technique and drills, working on swimming faster, more efficiently. And then you got to marry them back together. All right. Thanks. Does anybody else want to talk about that? Or Mike, you want to move on to another question, specific no, question? I I just had one thing I wanted to ask you about racing. I've heard it's every second stroke that you're breathing. Is that what you normally do, Mike? Yes. If you look at um, fast swimmers in races, open yeah. water and pool, most of them breathe every second stroke just because of the sheer output of effort that they're doing. And they're not paying a big price in technique or efficiency when they breathe. Okay. But a lot of, open water and triathlete swimmers do pay a huge price every time they breathe because they slow their stroke down and they lift their head and they're not swimming at 85% plus effort. They're only swimming at like 60% effort. So a novice swimmer may be more beneficial to swim at 60% effort, breathing every third with good form. They may actually go a lot faster than if they put out that 80% effort and started breathing, over breathing and just getting themselves in a, in a mess. And, and I think that's really where most people are at in a wetsuit too. There's, and that's one of, uh, was one of my issues in this book. Uh, there's very, very, very little mention of wetsuit swimming and wetsuit specific technique. And at least in our area, it's like what 90% of all races are wetsuit legal. There's very few races around here that you, you don't wear a wetsuit. You know, maybe you go to Mexico once in a while or something, but almost all of our races are wetsuit legal. And that's probably the one area that I spend a lot of time trying to figure out uh, and trying to coach people on that is just not addressed in anything I've read to this point. What was the next question that I had on the, our specific questions to this. Yep. Okay. So question number two, you know, we had a total of six questions and we've really only covered two of them. So the next one is the, uh, the, the, can you explain some specific details of the phases of freestyle or the one that might just transition well, as we're talking about some open water swimming is the uh, high turnover for open water swimming about the turnover and where do you think we all fail, which might be a good one to just transition into at this point. Not fail, where do you fit or what is your rate, you know, where do you, are you fall? on the low side or the high where, side or where, where do you, you consider fall? yourself to be? Right, are you the shoulder driven, hip driven or hybrid? Right, so you wanna talk about the- Skittles, where are you at Skittles? What's your, where would you say your stroke rate is? Are you on the high side or the low side? I definitely, I definitely have a hard shoulder hit when I when I'm swinging my shoulders, uh, but I try to use my hips too. Especially 
the better I get with my kick, I think I've gotten better with my hips because that gives you more power too. But you know, you know me, I, when I get, when I go get over exerted, I start shaking too much. So I think it's my, mostly my shoulders. What yeah. about Liz? Liz, tell me about your stroke rate. Um, it seems like when I'm doing open water swims, it has a lot to do with the actual water itself. If it's really high surf, um, I'll have a tendency to shorten up and really have kind of more of a high elbow. Um, you know, if I'm in a lake that's like a glass, I'll swim more like, um, I guess the hybrid um, or just a slower rate and uh, taking advantage of the, the buoyancy with the wetsuit. I love that you think that you do that and that you try to do that, but you don't do that. But I like that you think that way because that's what you should be trying to do. You're a high stroke rate swimmer, period. From the second you get in the pool, the very first hundred of practice, I go, man, I wish you would settle down and just float out there and stretch out a little bit, but you're high strung in the pool. You just, and you do the same in open water. You're pretty fast stroke rate. And you do still have a little bit of a range, but you're definitely to the higher side of stroke rate. And higher stroke rate equals higher heart rate in general. And that's one of the things you need to work on is how can I keep my heart rate a little lower? You're not afraid to work. You work really hard and it's awesome. But you could probably go about as fast, especially with their suit on, dialing it down a little bit. Let's ask Alon the same question. Where are you in the stroke rate range? I think I'm moderate or slow. Yep. Um, my problem is with the legs. I think I... Even though the book said that it's 15 to 20 percent, the weight of the legs, but still, I think that uh, I'm a bit uh, need to improve this one. And Ryan had a question about the legs, or a, uh, a couple questions about legs, or uh, the arm underwater out in front. What was mm -hmm. that question, Ryan? Yeah, there was. That's one thing I didn't understand when they said. Um, let me just grab it here. Yeah. It, the quote was, there's also a balanced benefit when you have an arm out front that makes it easier to counteract sinking legs. And if your body is floating, which I think most of ours naturally is, even though may, mine maybe less than others, if you have a floating arm out front, I would think that's letting you, making your legs sink. So I just pulled up, can you guys see this picture on my screen now? Yep. All right, good. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Uh, bang, bang, bang. All right, so that red thing kind of represents your center of balance. And if your head's high and your hands are close to the surface out in front, just trying to float essentially, your legs are gonna sink. Uh, having your back arch is not good either. And when you put weight down on your chest and your head, it helps make your legs a little bit lighter. And an arm out in front of you, uh, having both arms out in front of your head is putting more weight in front of your center of buoyancy, which is your lungs or your chest, versus when your arms are back behind your chest more of your body weight is behind you. In other words, I don't have very much body weight from my chest up. I have a lot of body weight from my chest down. But if I have both arms above me and I'm leaning on my chest, the weight of both arms helps keep my legs up. So that's, that's what that means is you have an arm extending underwater with weight on your armpit and then you wait till the recovery arm is out in front of your shoulder, that's gonna put more weight in front and your legs stay lighter. And it's a really hard thing to do because when you feel like you're sinking, you wanna rush the front arm. And what you have to do is extend it and lean a little longer on the armpit. And this is why I feel there's a big difference in regular pool swimming and wetsuit swimming. 
because when you swim in a pool in a wet, when you swim in a pool with no equipment on Ryan, you feel like you're sinking. So you've got to rush that front arm, especially when you get a breath and you can't have the patience to stay out there and wait for that other hand to come in because you feel your leg sinking and you're just not getting enough propulsion from your kick. Or if you do, it's at a very high cost and then you, you gas out in a short amount of time. But with the wetsuit, that's not gonna happen. The legs are gonna stay up. Uh, so you can have a little more timing of staying out there longer. And this is why I think stroke rate needs to be slower when you're wearing a wetsuit. And this is where the book to me is a little confusing to many of you because it says high rate, high rate, in open water, high rate, high rate, high stroke rate. But a lot of you are not gonna benefit from that, especially in your suit. And I was swimming yesterday or whenever it was Saturday when we did our swim with uh, Sophie, and I don't think she's on the call right now, but um, she's you know 14 years old, little skinny thing in her wetsuit and not a lot of upper body strength. And she was just ripping through the water with her arms and slipping the hand back instead of getting that fingers down, nice catch and pull with a longer, stronger distance per stroke. And I don't know if it's a strength issue with her shoulders, uh, probably partially is that, you know, of her just not trusting the wetsuit because she's really lean and she has you know, a little bit more leg power and ankle flexibility than all of us, just like Christina here on the call. If you've ever seen Christine swim, she's got a great kick, but not a lot of upper body strength. So in the wetsuit, she's still going to want to kick, uh, but not get a lot out of the arm stroke yet. So that's something we got to develop. But we have the other side of the equation of those of you that know, don't get much out of the kick. So you put on your wetsuit, you just drag your legs and they still float. But the problem with that is you lose the core connection and the rigidity of your, and you don't have a deliberate kick. So that's where that kick comes in. And that is one of the, you know, areas in this book. And it talked about, uh, is that kicking role. And I think that was one of my questions. What yeah. are some of the benefits or purposes for kicking? And what are some of the cons and what kind of kicker do you consider yourself to be? Uh, Megan, where are you at on this, on this thing with kicking? Where would you say you're at? Um, I'm very kick driven. Mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a competitive swimmer in the pool, um, I, I rely pretty heavily on my kick. And the, I, I've only been out with the group swimming once, but I instantly, you know, jumped in. I had it warmed up and I was hyperventilating within a couple minutes because I'm so used to like a super high volume flutter kick. Mm -hmm. So I have to intentionally tell myself, slow down, don't kick, don't kick, don't kick, and do rely on that, that wetsuit. So that's a concerted effort I have to make with, with my kick because it shoots my heart rate straight up. Yep. So it's quite interesting here. We've got, you know, 15 people or so on this call. And the answer is the same for all of us on what we should do with our kick. Some of you need to be kicking more than you are because you're not, or you're opening your legs way too wide and scissor kicking as a stabilizer. And it's not really, that's not really a kick. It's a stabilization motion. When the legs open up really wide, like to get a breath or something. And most people that do that have no idea to the extent that they're doing it until they see it on video, right, Nor? <laughs> he's seen himself in the past and he's gotten a lot better, but I mean, it was pretty extreme. He could almost touch the lane lines with his toes. His leg would come so far apart. I was not a when, when I was, was an X. And I back in the old the days, but that was, that was at Equinox where the lanes are narrower, right? <laughs> yep, that was three, four years ago. Nine foot, they're nine foot wide lanes. But, um, you know, so that's a kind of interesting thing that we're all reading the same book, but we have, to, we have to filter it differently based on our own needs or our own weaknesses or whatever. So some of you need to do more kicking to kind of wake up your body and everything and help keep that rigidity and balance and rotation and connection and everything. And then there's some of you, some, mostly the girls, that need to dial the kick down a bit and learn how to just power through with the upper body 
And I just had a girl today telling me, you know, oh, these paddles suck, man. I hate using paddles. And it's like, yeah, you, you're not connected. You're not, you have no upper body strength to begin with. She can't pull herself out of the pool with the deck up. She probably couldn't do a pull up, let alone five or seven of them. So yeah, she's not going to get much out of her pull until she learns how to really connect it or do strength training like band work. Vu, you need to be doing band work because you lack that upper body strength too to get enough propulsion. Um, Vu, where do you sit on either pulling or kicking? What are your issues there? Well, in the, in the pool, I feel like I'm faster when I put on fins. But I think my legs are sinking. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, you're a lot faster when you have fins because the fin does the bending to get the propulsion. And when you don't have the fins on, the feet just sit like hooks towards the bottom. So you can kick hard, but you're not going to get propulsion out of it. But when you do that with the fin on, the fin bends and it actually gives you the propulsion out of it. So you will go a lot faster with fins. Um, and you're also quite a bit faster when you pull as well, because the legs are getting up and out of the way. And that's a good exercise for you to do. And it was one of the things mentioned in the book. I think it was on one of the uh, coaches, you know, expert ideas or whatever that he did a lot of pulling with athletes. And I'm a, I'm a firm believer in that as well. If you are really a sinker and not very efficient in the pool, don't just waste your time swimming uphill all the time and struggling. You might as well just get on the pulling gear and get some aerobic conditioning at being level because that's what you're going to do in your wetsuit in the open water. Anybody else while we're on this topic of uh, kicking, anybody else want to share what kind of kicker they are? How about you, Maria? What's your deal? Kicker or puller? You're still on mute. Can you take yourself off of mute, Maria? Let me try that. Are you off? Let's try that. I'm on the phone. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Oh. Yes. Um, I'm a kicker, but I'm getting better at pulling, I think, because yeah, I've been working super, on my... Super slow motion pull when you were pulling before, and now you're kind of getting it down to have a little bit more ump in the pull, and that's, that's good, because we're, we're not going to get a lot of propulsion out of our kick in open water in a wetsuit. Very few of us will. But again, I, I want to reiterate for everybody out there, that doesn't mean don't kick. It means kick connected and narrow to help set up the rhythm and the core tension and all that stuff for the rest of the stroke. But yeah, um, Maria, do you know what stroke rate you're at now? Do you have any idea? No idea. I don't even know how to figure that out. I get, oh, I, I guess count the number of <laughs> times I go across the lane. <laughs> so stroke count is how many strokes it takes you to get across the pool. Stroke count. Stroke rate is how fast you take those strokes. So let's see if I can find this. Uh, this is a really amazing and simple equation. I'm not sure if I have it, but I think I do. One second, let's get back on that, that and share. And then let's get out of the full screen. Didn't want to do that. Oh, no. Almost there. There we go. Let me look at Dole. All right, that didn't work. All right, I'm going to try it a different way. I have a note here, this note. This is my little diagram of different swimming. This is, I'm a really good artist as you can see, huh? Can you guys see this yet? Not yet. Not yet. No shared screen yet. Let me try that one more time. Back to there. Share the screen. Share the diagram. Share. I'm being very facetious about my drawing skills, but, um, all right, it's basically this simple equation. V equals SL times SR. That's, that's the magic of swimming that's so simplistic. Velocity or speed 
is a combination of your stroke length times your stroke rate. So stroke length is how many strokes it takes you to get across the pool. Stroke rate is how fast you take those strokes. We use a tempo trainer to measure our stroke rate and we count strokes to get our distance per stroke or our stroke length. So some people are better at stroke length, some at stroke rate. You really have to have a combination of both. And real simple math, if you took 20 strokes to get across the pool in 20 seconds, you're taking about one stroke per second, okay? Uh, and that it's a little off of that because there's about a second to two seconds of push off time underwater before you come up into swimming. But if you were taking 20 strokes of length in t and getting across in 20 seconds, and you did that for four laps, that's a one 20 hundred free, which most of you would be stoked with to be able to sustain. So that's like easy math is something you can try to do at the pool is swim 40 25s, trying to take 20 strokes a lap in 60 strokes a minute, you know, with the tempo trainer. And that will build your neuromuscular patterning to do that. But what do I see? I see people taking 27 to 30 strokes a length and swimming at like 55 strokes a minute, you know, or maybe they are high tempo, but they're still taking a lot of strokes per lap or per length. And, and even if, even if, uh, you know, their stroke rates kind of on the higher side, it's still, even if you're 65 strokes a minute, which is reasonably quick, uh, it's still almost one stroke per second. So if you take 27 strokes instead of 20, it's almost seven seconds longer. It's at least five seconds longer to just do that one lap if you're really slipping and inefficient with your stroke. So this book was talking about, it's not really about having that length or distance per stroke in open water. It's more about stroke rate. It's not, it's both. You really need both. Just like you need technique and conditioning, it's stroke length and stroke rate married together that give you speed. So don't get too hung up on one side of the equation or the other. Improve in both areas. Get your stroke rate a little quicker if it needs to be and get your stroke length a little longer if it needs to be. And if you're way low or way high on one of those, then do a lot of work on the other side of the equation. In other words, if you're already swimming 70 strokes a minute, you don't have to work to get to 72. You need to work to take fewer strokes with 70 strokes a minute. If you're already taking 13 strokes a length to get across the pool, you don't really need to work on your length or distance per stroke. You need to work on your tempo or your stroke rate. Uh, most of you guys are somewhere in the middle. You're not at those two extremes. So you want to try to go from taking 22 strokes a length to taking 20. You want to go from being 58 strokes a minute to being 62 strokes a minute. And making those subtle, small changes ends up being a big change in time. Mike, I have a question about stroke rate. Um, so when I look at my, my swimming after on Strava or whatever, is it accurate? Because it, it's mostly it says like 40 is probably the highest. Yeah, um, so it's half. It's one arm going in the water every time. Okay, so, so that if would it be says like 32, that's really 64 strokes a minute. I so see. when we okay. use the tempo trainer, we're using it to each hand hit. So that would be like 60 to 65 strokes a minute. Okay. But the watch is going to be giving you stroke cycles, which is one arm going into the water. It's the difference in running of saying going at 90 cadence or 180 steps a minute. It's the same thing. It's how many times your feet are hitting the ground is 180 times, but you're at 90 cadence is one leg hitting the ground. So here's my little uh, drawing. Can you guys see that? Yeah. So this is over here, my lovely drawing. It looks more like a spider, but this is what I see poor swimmers do. Their elbow, when they get a breath, goes behind their body above the water. And then that causes the legs to splay open as a stabilizer. And then it causes the arm that's pulling to go way across center line. So it looks more like an L shape. 
instead of keeping fingers towards the bottom like this swimmer here. So we never want our elbow to be above our body or behind our body. We always want it to be out in front of our body because gravity is pushing down. So that initiates the rotation. And this is a big mistake I see really frequently is people over rotating to get a breath, the elbow goes behind the back and then the arm crosses over underwater and the legs splay to get the breath. So that is a really common problem that we see is this problem. Uh, and that brings me to a really controversial or, or important point in this book. And that was the, the recovery part of the stroke, the recovery part of the stroke. Who wants to tell us what their, um, what style of recovery? Do they have a high elbow or a straight arm recovery? Both. You have both, Jimena? Yeah. No, they, they emphasized a lot the high elbow. But I thought that was for the pool. I was confused there because they said straight arm is better for open water versus elbow for the pool. I don't know what I have, to be honest. Yeah, well, I, would, I mean, old coaching, I was always gr grew up with um, high elbow, right? I never heard of a straight arm recovery until just recently, like in the last year or so. So I want you to take that word, the, that phrase out of your vocabulary, straight arm recovery. There, we do not want to do a straight arm recovery, okay? But it's not necessarily, uh, uh, it's not high elbow either. Let me bring this back up one more time. I'm going to share it. Uh, so I, I had one drawn and I, I lost it, but uh, this right here over here, uh, I wish I could draw on this. The elbow is the same height. So what I call it is high elbow or high hand. The okay. elbow is still at the same height. I'm gonna turn off uh, something else here. Wait a second. Get to there. Dang it. Uh, um, sorry about this. I'm gonna turn off the stop share. I got to get to my video, choose my background, no background. Okay. High elbow recovery. The hand is lower. This is kind of traditional recovery like this. High hand recovery. Did my elbow, is it, it's at exactly the same place. We want to just circle a high hand recovery, but the elbow, it's not straight arm. I'm not doing a straight arm recovery. It's purely my hand is higher or lower than my elbow. But the elbow is in exactly the same place, whether I'm here or it's up here. But that higher hand recovery is a lot easier to have the higher tempo. It's, um, it's, easier to clear the water. It's easier to swim close to other people around you because you're not getting your arms stuck on hitting them. You circle a little bit higher to the sky. Uh, you don't get as tired with the wetsuit on. So change your thoughts to high elbow or high hand, but the elbow is still in the same spot. And you don't have to have a high end recovery, but I think you're going to find it to be a lot easier to do a high hand recovery as you come around, but the, the arm is not straight. You do not want it locked out, because if you do, you're gonna come around and you're gonna crash onto the water with a straight arm, and you're gonna press down. But if you just let the hand fly high, it still can drop in, enter, not at full extension, and then extend underwater. So think of high hand recovery, not necessarily high elbow, and Ryan, you had a question or a comment about how your hand exits the water. Will you ask that question? Yeah, they, they did. Um, they were talking about imagining an eye in your hand throughout the stroke. It's pointed towards your feet, the rear, and then you rotate your hand so that it points towards your thigh uh, as it exits. And uh, I had never heard that before. And I'm, I swam for a bit at Swim Labs, which is an indoor where they video you in an indoor tank. 
And I threw so much water out of that tank on the ground and I never knew why. And I think it's because I was always bringing my hand, looking at the, the palm of my hand, looking at the ceiling of the indoor swim place and scooping water out like that rather than exiting it with the pinky first. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So if you guys put your screens, as opposed to having like the, the gallery view, if you set, set it to speaker view, it'll make uh, it a little bit bigger to be able to see me. Um, thumb, thumb brushes the leg on the exit and the little finger comes out first and it circles up towards the sky and comes back in. In the book, it says fingertips first, palm down. I think it should be thumb slightly down because when your thumb is slightly down, your elbow stays higher. If your hand is flat, your elbow drops. We don't want that on the entry. But back to the exit, thumb brushes the front of your leg and then it circles up. This is what I see people do, flick. Flick that water behind their back. And maybe you're doing this, Ryan. It might have been wet on one side of the pool because your yeah. other arm was throwing water right. across your ass all the way out the pool on the other side. Yeah, exactly. And I don't let some people swim in the wall lane because they do that crap and they're getting me wet when I'm coaching. And I'm like, get away. You got to swim another lane because they flick the water. Uh -huh. They flick the water behind their back with that wrist break. So it's Thumb brushes the leg and it just circles back to the front. Thumb brushes and it circles back. And I think it's pinky out first and it circles to the sky. And then you're going to land thumb angle down, not necessarily thumb first, but a slight angle. We call it the bow of a ship. That's how you want the arm to pierce. And I did like that spearing talk that they put in there to spear the water when your hand goes in. That's really good because the spear in the front is connected to the, to the hand exiting with some speed in the back of the stroke. So guys are gonna have to play with that. Do some air swimming. Air swimming means you stand in front of a mirror at your home and you watch yourself try to do it. And we did this for you know two months on, on soup can swimming. And uh, I watched a lot of weird looking swim strokes on the land and it kind of explained what was going on in the pool. So um, it's, that's a little homework assignment for you to try. And before I forget, next week, you're all invited to come over to my house for the meeting if you want and play on the VASA trainer in the garage uh, before or after the session. And we can do it uh, somewhat outside and I've got a pretty big table here, whatever. So those of you that aren't too afraid of me breathing on them, I'll wear a mask, but you can come try out of the VASA ERG and, and I've got a mirror that goes on the floor underneath so you can kind of try out some of these things. And it was one of the questions a lot of people have, well, do I need to get a, a VASA? Not really, you guys have enough access to pools on a regular basis in open water, but can you learn something from being on one? Hell yeah. Uh, Finding out how much actual watts or power you put out in your pull is pretty entertaining to see how little your pull phase is and where you're pulling out and how awkward it feels and what real power is, you know, of doing that D shape that I talk about of the hand going parallel to the floor for a long time and then circling back fast to the front. Because if your pull's only this big, that's not going to put out very much power. And when it's much longer, with acceleration to the back, you put out a lot more watts. And I think, Nor, you've come over and done some, right? Have you done some on my VASA training? Yeah, I've done once. It was, it was different. I mean, it takes a lot of energy for sure. It's, it kicks your ass in a hurry. It's way It harder. was nice looking at the mirror below and your stroke because one of the things I realized with that is I used to cross over a lot uh -huh. the center line. And when I read it, clearly says that's one of the reasons you actually scissor kick. Definitely. So, yep. uh, yeah, I think that definitely helped in some regards to straighten my streamline in a way. And I think, yeah, it's definitely something different and interesting.
So next week, anyone that wants to, I'll send it out in the invite. I'll give you my address and you can come over anytime after five o'clock and we'll do the meeting at six, but we'll rotate people through on the bench with the, with the mirror underneath you because it'll really open your eyes to a lot of things technique wise that you could be doing or learning. Do you have power or not? Or maybe it's wider and narrower than you thought. I have a mirror that goes on the floor underneath the unit and I have stripes on it. There's a white stripe in the middle that's right under the rail. And then there's like blue, green, and yellow lines. And I have you pull over the top of the different lines and you find out kind of where your power phase is and you learn how wide or narrow it is. And sometimes it's wider than you realize and sometimes it's narrower. Or it's, it's where it should be, but you're not doing it. You're pulling underneath the, the center bar, your hands like this way across the center instead of staying out in the track where the, all the propulsion is. All right, we are at 7.04. Yep. So we are getting ready to wrap this up. And Natalie had asked me to do it at the beginning, but we're gonna do it at the end. We